so third worldism, you know, the idea that uh, third world countries are kind of the, the primary uh, places where socialism is going to happen. And, you know, historically, uh, that, that seems to have been the case. There have been quite a few socialist countries in the third world, the, the global south, whatever kind of term you'd want to use to describe it. Uh, and honestly, I mean, in my opinion at least, they've really been some of the most successful examples of, of socialism. Uh, you know, like in Burkina Faso, and Mozambique, the Seychelles, uh, Cuba, I think. I mean, they would have been successful, I'm fairly sure, if the U.S. had not uh, interfered quite so directly. You know, just considering how... Uh, well they managed to do you know uh, considering the US shenanigans but I think you know uh, unless there there's a global third world revolution and like every third world country uh, becomes socialist all at once which I kind of doubt would happen I think if we're you know forever gonna have a chance at any any kind of global revolution there will have to be a, you know, a socialist revolution in a first world country, in a powerful, uh, resource rich first world country. And in my opinion, the most likely country for that to happen in is Japan. You know, currently, anyway. Who can say what will happen in the future of, uh, you know, America? to make that more likely, or anywhere else in the world. Uh, but Japan, as it stands in 2017, uh, seems to be the most likely for me. And there's a few reasons why. Uh, well, actually, first, there's a few reasons why you know, it, it wouldn't happen. Uh, first, and probably most importantly... There are lots of aspects of Japanese culture, and especially Japanese work culture, that are kind of antithetical to socialism and socialist concepts of work and the relationship a worker has with their work. Uh, in Japanese work culture, corporations are kind of treated like uh, a family and... Uh, employees are supposed to dedicate their entire life to their work, more or less. Um, and that employees owe their workers, rather than the other way around. Or no, employees owe their bosses, rather than the other way around. As is you know, more the, the socialist way of looking at that relationship. Um, so that, in addition to the fact that the Japanese government has historically cracked down pretty harshly on any serious uh, socialist movements or you know, prominent socialist figures, oftentimes just, you know, assassinating them. So, I mean, the likelihood of that is slightly diminished now that they're you know, a liberal democracy, but, you know, it could still happen. It's not uh, unprecedented for that kind of thing to occur. But I think that those possible roadblocks are far outweighed by the current, you know, material conditions of the, of the Japanese worker. And that, uh, you know, Japan's um, economic position in the world is, uh, you know, more... Uh, more likely to foster socialism than uh, really anywhere else, I feel. In the first world, again. Uh, firstly, and you know, kind of most obviously most uh, well-known, I think, is, is the concept of karoshi, which is you know, literally translated as work, like overwork death, um, which you know, is, is basically just uh, a phenomenon that's been happening in Japan for since like the 80s, I believe, where workers will work so much overtime uh, 
that they are susceptible to uh, diseases caused by stress, like heart conditions, uh, diseases caused by exhaustion, uh, stuff like that. And of course, you know, good old fashioned uh, suicide caused by stress usually. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a really common thing in Japan, believe it or not. One in four, uh, is it, I don't know if it's workers overall or just, you know, you know, kind of quote unquote white collar workers, office workers, um, who are at risk for, uh, Karoshi. And, uh, it's fucked up. And the government has, uh, really done incredibly little to, uh, you know, address the issue. I think it was really only last year that uh, they made any uh, attempts to address it at all when they limited the amount of overtime to 100 hours a month, which that's a really, really high ceiling uh, and one that doesn't really prevent this issue in any way. Uh, so, assuming that the Japanese government will be as uh, slow to deal with this in the future, then, uh, you know, that's this problem's just going to keep going on, and hopefully Japanese workers will realize the, uh, the shit that it is. And they will try to uh, put a stop to it. Uh, another thing is that Japan's economy for the last 30 years has uh, fluctuated wildly. I mean, of course, you know, a lot of people point to um, post-war Japan as an example of the success of capitalism, the, the post-war economic miracle, as it is called, um, where Japan, you know, they converted kind of from more of this... Uh, state capitalism thing to free market capitalism and they became uh, one of the largest economies in the world within a relatively short amount of time but in the 1980s uh, there was you know and really ever since there have been a series of big economic recession recessions uh, that have hugely decreased job security decreased wages uh, decreased the amount of jobs all these things that um, make Japan's financial future very, very uncertain. And, you know, there, there's lots of economists that speculate that there's going to be another big uh, crash in the American market. And if it has, you know, if it's the size of the 2008 recession or you know, even bigger, perhaps, and it has similar global ramifications than Japan as well, Japan's economy could uh, suffer pretty greatly within, uh, you know, the next few years, if that is to happen. Uh, so that as well, you know, with people unemployment and uh, less working money and stuff, that is a, a facilitator for socialist thought. Um... This isn't so much a, a problem as a possible um, hopeful sign, but the whole uh, birth rate crisis and general just uh, the neat phenomenon in Japan among uh, younger people, uh, where a lot of younger people, mostly younger men, um... So, you know, it might not quite be as uh, as much of a socialist movement as I, you know, one could characterize it as. But, uh, you know, this, the younger people who, who see the shitty conditions and the shitty lives that Japanese uh, workers live, and they essentially just swear off the whole thing and uh, just don't work at all, basically. Uh, and I don't know if, you know, just not working at all is not, you know, just sitting in your room all day watching anime and playing video games, if that's, uh, the socialist response that, uh, one should have to 
that situation, but it's something. There, there's certainly discontent there, and uh, you know that should be uh, appealed to. I think. Uh, another thing that's kind of a symptom of this culture of overwork is, uh, you know, one of one of the uh, the more prevalent uh, just cultural sites, I guess, in. Uh, you know, in in real life Japan, and it's reflected in Japanese media and Japanese art, is uh, the site of a bunch of uh, suit-clad office workers going to a bar and getting drunk, getting, like, really drunk. And uh, that's a really common thing as well. Uh, alcoholism in Japan is uh, an issue. Uh people become dependent on alcohol to uh to deal with their stress and uh become and then you know obviously becoming an alcoholic compounds that stress and uh it's a big old cycle and uh so yeah it's basically just kind of a shit house there in Japan right now uh there's a huge number of industries where people are underpaid and overworked, and uh, basically, we gotta save that shit, man. So, if any, if I got any Japanese people in my audience right now, you should uh, start fucking agitating, man. Cause uh, you owe it to your countrymen. Also, uh, tell your people to stop being so racist. That would be nice. Uh. But yeah, 